In 2001, the small village of East Tilbury in Thurrock, Essex, became the focus of widespread media attention after a 15-year-old girl disappeared whilst on her way to school. Nearly two decades on, and this story still resonates with the public, not least because of the desire to see her parents get the justice they so deeply need and richly deserve. Danielle Jones was the eldest child and only daughter of Mum Linda. We were thrilled to have a little girl first. She was an adorable baby um, and a good baby. Very happy when she was born. We were, we were very close, Mum and daughter, very close. She grew up with two younger brothers. Mothered them, what I would say was a normal older sister. Academically, she struggled and she, she had lack of self-confidence with how she looked a little bit as well, but in certain aspects, she was quite confident. She adored animals and children. Her dream was to be a nursery nurse, you know, to look after young children and babies. Danielle was a conscientious student. On the 18th of June 2001, she was preparing to head off to school. I remember her calling out to me, I'm off now. Bye, see you later. Perfectly normal Monday morning. Mitchell, he was still in junior school then, would always be sitting in by the window, watch her go off. Linda assumed that Danielle had gone to school as usual. I got a phone call from the school, half two-ish to say she'd not been in, which just wasn't her, just wasn't her at all. We decided, let's just see if she comes home with an explanation. But Danielle didn't return home at the normal time, prompting brother Mitchell to disclose that he'd noticed something unusual about her behavior that morning. He'd seen her go out of the gate, turn left as normal, within seconds, walk back past the house the other way. We'd phoned friends and discovered that no one had heard from her. We started then trawling the estate to see whether we could find her. I stayed at home in case she turned up and it, it was just bedlam, you know, your worst nightmare. I then phoned the police and from that point on, panic just set in. Complete panic. Danielle disappeared on Monday morning last week. Danielle is a home-loving girl with no history of running away and no apparent reason to disappear. They had the police dogs come round, the sniffer dogs, and they followed her scent around the estate at a certain point, and then her scent disappeared. The police were trying to find Danielle, and as several days passed, DS Keith Davis was part of the team drafted in to investigate her disappearance. She was just a normal schoolgirl and uh, with no issues around truancy. So by the middle of that week, I think there were some real concerns about her welfare and fears that she may well have been abducted. Now, Danielle was last seen when she left her home and she walked along this road here onto Coronation Avenue. The Witness statements supported the theory that Danielle had been abducted. There have been significant sightings of the blue transit van on East Tilbury that morning. There was a neighbour just round the corner that saw Daniel arguing with a man in a transit van. There was another significant witness a little further along from where Daniel lived on the route to her school bus that saw a man arguing with a girl fitting Daniel's description on foot on the pavement. The last and positive sighting of Danielle is on the opposite side of the road. This witness knew Danielle and it was definitely her. Another witness saw a blue van go past at the significant time. The man driving and a young girl who's described as being slumped in the passenger seat. These sightings gave police a chilling lead as to Danielle's possible abductor. Her uncle Stuart Campbell had a blue transit van. So he became 
uh, a very significant suspect by the middle of that first week. Forty-three-year-old builder Stuart Campbell was married to the sister of Danielle's dad. He would come round to our house all the time, seemed a genuinely nice person. And we went out with him for days, spent time as family, doing family things. He had a, a big personality, very big personality, um, and would like, like to be the centre of attention a little bit, but we just took that as that's how he was and didn't think anything untoward about it. There was nothing unusual about Campbell's behaviour as an uncle until Danielle reached her teens. I can remember that we'd been on holiday and we'd had um, some photos done of the children and her collarbones showed and he made some little uncomfortable comments to her about, are you sure that's your collarbones we can see, not your breasts? And I was a little bit like, it's a bit strange thing to say, but yeah, didn't pull him up on it because just thought he was having a laugh and a joke. And I think looking back now, that was probably the start of when he was showing a little bit more interest in her than he was comfortable, probably. We became aware that he would meet her off of the school bus sometimes. Because he was a builder, he'd say, I've got a quote just in the area. And because Stuart was expecting a baby, he'd say, oh, I bought a few baby bits, Danielle. If you come and do a quote with me, I'll show you what we've bought. But then he'd always bring her home within half an hour. Because there was always an explanation as to, oh, I've bought a few bits for the baby. I thought she'd like to see them. Up to 50 officers are now involved in the search for 15-year-old Danielle Jones. She's now been missing for seven days. Now following her disappearance, Campbell claimed that he'd heard from Danielle. He said that he'd had a text from her, I think along the lines of, you're the best uncle in the world, um, I love you to bits. It was just very bizarre that he was the only one that she would want to contact. Today at St Clair's, pupils were asked to help in finding Danielle, the summer classmate, for many a friend. If she didn't want to text Tone or I because she thought she'd be in trouble, I think she would have texted one of her friends. I don't think I believe for one minute he would be the first port of call. I really don't. The police also questioned the authenticity of these text messages. And from the moment Stuart Campbell had been established as a suspect, they had him under surveillance. Everything he did while he was under surveillance just really confirmed in our mind that he was a suspect. He didn't go on a public search uh, looking for Danielle on the Thursday. Everyone was going and looking anywhere I could possibly think to look. He just wasn't doing any of that at all. He did nothing that a genuine uncle concerned about her welfare would do, uh, completely the opposite. So I think he was arrested around about midnight on the Thursday of that week. We interviewed him with an urgent interview under superintendent's authority, and we'd hoped that he'd be able to lead us to her. But he maintained a no comment interview for the time that he was in custody. He was well and truly the primary suspect of the, of, of the investigation, and we needed to know a lot more about him as an individual. So I, together with a small team of officers, uh, had the title of the Campbell team, for want of a better word, and uh, my task really was to look into Stuart Campbell as an individual. Coming up. It was all very much brushed under the carpet. Stupidly, we gave him the benefit of the doubt that it was blown out of all proportion. The dark secrets of Stuart Campbell revealed. We identified about 30 victims, some pre-1989, some post-89. This was a precursor for what he intended to do with Daniel on the 18th of June. On the 18th of June 2001, 15-year-old Danielle Jones went missing. She was last seen leaving her parents' home in East Tilbury to catch a bus to St. Clair's Secondary School in Stamford-La Hope. She never arrived. 
A short time after she left home, a girl matching her description was seen getting into a blue transit-style van. This witness knew Danielle, and it was definitely her. Danielle's uncle, Stuart Campbell, was a prime suspect in her abduction. Now in police custody, he was refusing to answer questions. The only thing he did give on that, those early interviews was, was an alibi for the day in question, Monday the 18th, when he said he'd been out early in the morning to Wicks DIY store, some miles from where he lived, and that he'd returned with some goods because he was a local builder. But we were able to actually fairly destroy his alibi through CCTV and through telephone evidence. We were able to show that when Stuart Campbell said he made a call to his wife at 8.25 to say he was running late from the Wix DIY store, we know that from the cell site analysis that that was more likely that he made that call at East Tilbury. The search of his home address in Grey is not far from where Daniel lived. It actually took place whilst he was in custody. Um, so that would have been on the early hours of Friday morning. And there were some significant fines. One of the key finds was a duffel bag that was actually in the loft of the home address. There was lingerie in there, there was handcuffs, there was condoms, uh, and there was a, a pair of white hold-up stockings. Some of these items were sent off for forensic analysis. The police would have to wait and see if they held a link to Danielle. But this wasn't the only lead. There was a diary which we actually called in our uh, investigation the Danielle diary. It wasn't her diary, it was his diary. There was lots of comments in there on particular days when Daniel had done something or he'd spent time with her and it clearly indicated to us that he had an obsession with her. There are not that many people like Stuart Campbell. He was completely obsessed with Danielle. This wasn't just some kind of interest he had. This dominated his entire life. One of the other significant finds there was a piece of paper which had the words written chloroform taser and uh, 1610, which was Daniel's pin number for a phone. It gave us a bit of an indication as to maybe what he'd been planning around uh, the 18th when we believe that uh, Daniel was abducted by him. I was certainly of, an in of a view that maybe he'd, he'd, he'd given Daniel some chloroform to actually render her unconscious during that time. Police also seized Campbell's computer, but they would have to wait to discover its contents. This was early days of computers, and we had to go to some fairly significant uh, experts to actually look at what he'd um, been looking at uh, and what he'd actually deleted, and he had deleted a number of images. A 40-year-old man arrested over the weekend on suspicion of abducting Danielle was today released on police bail to appear again on the 22nd of August. A very, very difficult decision was then made because we had insufficient evidence to charge him with any offences and we still hoped and believed that maybe Daniel was still alive. And again, he was subject to some fairly consistent um, uh, surveillance. Search teams arrived early this morning to begin the latest stage in the hunt for Danielle Jones. I think he was a very clever chap and I think he probably knew that he was going to be subject to police attention. We visited uh, a building site in the early hours of the morning, which we initially gave some concern to about, you know, was there somewhere that Danielle's body could be. They were led to the construction site in Greys by significant new information. They won't say where that came from. At this point, Campbell's identity had not been released. But Danielle's disappearance was still attracting huge interest from the press. The posters will go up in the Thurrock area, uh, specifically into shop windows. Um, we will also be looking at putting them on trains. So much so that Alan Cook was appointed media manager, especially to deal with this. Without a doubt, for that particular summer of 2001, it was the big news story. 
Posters showing Danielle Jones are the latest attempt by police to jog the memories of local people. The police realised that the media could play a part in supporting their investigation. Police are in desperate need of the public's help to solve this case. So if anyone does have any information, you can get hold of detectives here any hour of the day or night. We wanted to keep this, the story alive in, in, in the news uh, because we wanted that information to come forward to help the investigation. So we, we proactively um, you know, sought media opportunities. It was always felt that the answer sort of lay within the community somewhere and that somebody must be able to tell us sort of something. Detectives investigating the disappearance of Danielle Jones have spent the night sifting through information from television viewers. Officers have had a superb response to their television appeal. Around 200 callers responded to last night's televised reconstruction the focus was on about general gathering of information rather than just focusing on individual suspects. I could have done as many as a, a dozen or more interviews within an hour or so um, uh, on, on an average day. Come home. <laughs> we miss you so desperately. Your brothers are dead. Just come home. The crucial thing was to find Danielle, and endless searches took place in the days and weeks after she went missing. Members of the local community have been heavily involved in the search for the 15-year-old who's been missing for nearly five weeks. Tomorrow the searches were predominantly in the local area based on any potential sightings, um, and they were very much intelligence-led or areas where we knew Stuart Campbell had been to. But the area around East Tilbury is a horrendous area to actually search. You've got the River Thames, you've got a huge refuge dump, a lot of waterborne environments, railway tracks. I mean, a very, very difficult areas to actually search for anything, uh, not least, uh, you know, a missing person. I can remember on the news seeing the police divers, and we had a few friends there with us. And I, I went into complete meltdown. What are they looking for? And they were saying, well, they're searching for a body. And I think it hit me like a lead balloon that I was actually watching on television divers searching for my daughter's body. Ultimately, we drew the conclusion that Danielle was no longer alive. And that it was a murder investigation and that we had a suspect. So uh, if, if you're going to take that through its natural conclusion of a court case and a conviction, then you, you've got to be able to prove that beyond reasonable doubt. It was looking more and more likely that Danielle was no longer alive. The police had been working tirelessly to uncover further evidence to prove that Stuart Campbell was her killer. This included discovering the truth behind some photos of young girls found in his home during the search. We found absolutely thousands of photographs that he had taken of young girls, scantily clad. He was a very clever motivator and he, he would portray himself as a, as a fashion photographer. He used to carry a little business card around him called Cinderella's. He would pick on 14, 15 year old girls who were starting to develop as young women and convince them that they could be models in the future and he would convince them to come back to his home address in Greys where he would systematically take photographs of them which would generally a lead to them removing items of their clothing. When we look at the research into child molesters, what we know about them is they tend to use three particular lures, the ego, the friendship and the attention. Which means that basically you convince your prey that you are a good person who just notices them. And indeed that's exactly what he does. We found that he'd previously been convicted of abducting a 14-year-old girl back in 1989. There'd been some plea bargaining and it had been reduced down to a much lesser offence um, on the basis that he didn't actually serve any time in custody. But even then, he'd managed to convince uh, his family members that this had all been a terrible mistake and he wasn't a guilty individual. We just at the time thought genuinely it was a young girl that had panicked, changed her mind, she didn't want photos done, and 
it was all very much brushed under the carpet. And there again, stupidly, we gave him the benefit of the doubt that it was blown out of all proportion. But that was a very significant find because it clearly identified um, a modus operandi that he was operating back in 89, which he'd simply operated on Daniel in 2001. Police wanted to see if there were more of Campbell's victims out there. We identified about 30 victims, uh, some pre-1989, some post-1989, and the, the range of offences against these poor young girls was ranging from simply taking photographs of them up to being sexually abused and, I, and I believe, raped. Most of the time it had not come to the notice of the local police because they were too embarrassed to either tell their parents uh, and, and more so report it to the police. So he got away with an awful lot of criminality. The theory that Daniel too could have been lured in by Campbell was looking ever more likely, especially when Linda recalled an incident some weeks prior to the 18th of June. On the 30th of April, we know from Linda that on that particular night, Daniel had gone with Stuart Campbell and he'd brought her back quite flustered. They came in, she ran upstairs, and he said, oh, I think she's had a funny turn. In his diary entry, um, I think he said, worst effect of Daniel came round, played some PC games with the boys. It also written, an accident, panic, but he'd rubbed that out. But through forensic recovery, we were able to find that. And through a witness who lived next door, she vividly remembered that night. She remembered a young girl's voice and a man's voice saying, I don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. It'll only take a couple of minutes. Campbell gave three different accounts, uh, eventually saying that he didn't actually want to say, but she'd actually wet herself and he was embarrassed for her and, and that's why he didn't want her to do anything that she didn't want to do. And we were very concerned that this was some sort of precursor event leading up to a subsequent uh, disappearance on the 18th of June. Because of the age she was and hormones and everything, I just thought, well, yeah, I suppose it's a possibility. She's had a bit of a funny turn and and she was she was quite upset about it all and didn't really want to talk to me about it. To get to a child, you have to get past the parents. So the whole grooming process starts with the parents. You have to get their trust. And groomers will often be offering to do favours, to help you out in some way, to situate themselves in the middle of the family. <laughs> and once, once he'd got in with Mum, he knew that that was the key to getting in with Danielle. Oh, I wasn't aware that I was being used in that way. In hindsight now, I can see little things maybe that he, he got me very much on side, I think. The forensic results from items in Campbell's home also supported the theory that his behaviour towards Danielle had been inappropriate. There was a, a pair of white hold-up stockings uh, that we found a significant uh, mix of DNA on. Uh, we think in a little blood stain, but it, the, the relevance was it was a mixed DNA profile of Danielle and Stuart Campbell. We felt we were making some good progress and there was a real need to re-arrest Campbell and put some further evidence to him. So he was re-arrested on the 17th of August of that, of that year. On the 18th of June 2001, 15-year-old Danielle Jones went missing on her way to school. Within a few days, her uncle, Stuart Campbell, was a prime suspect in her abduction. The police had uncovered damning evidence against Campbell, which included a history of abuse against at least 30 teenage girls. And nine weeks after Danielle's disappearance, even though the schoolgirl's body remained undiscovered, Campbell was strongly suspected of her murder. Detectives are continuing to question one of Danielle's uncles, 43-year-old Stuart Campbell. He's being held on suspicion of murder. He maintained no comment for most of the time unless he was on an area where he thought he was on good ground and comfortable. He liked the challenge of the interview and would challenge us. And the psychologist's view listening to him during interview was that he clearly had psychopathic uh, tendencies. It was very clear from those interviews that we were looking at the prime suspect. 
We still had insufficient evidence around Daniel's abduction and murder, but we're able to charge him with some holding offences uh, to remind him in custody. The investigation continued, and police were building up a picture of the relationship between Campbell and Danielle immediately prior to her disappearance. Just three weeks earlier, whilst Danielle was on holiday with her parents, Campbell had displayed some disturbing behaviour in her absence. We know that when they were on their family holiday in France, that he had access to the house. He'd fitted a door previously and he retained a key. And we know that he got into the house during that time. And left two notes for her in her bedroom. Her friend told us that Daniela had discovered notes in her pencil case. We didn't know that until after she'd gone missing. I was, I just felt sick. It, it just wasn't normal behaviour for an uncle-niece relationship. It's disturbing that Campbell leaves love notes in Danielle's room. It's disturbing because it shows the delusion that he was having some form of a relationship with her shows you the secrecy that was involved in that relationship and that gives us insight in the type of experience that Danielle was having with Campbell. A week later, Danielle was away once again. She'd been on a geography field trip the week before she went missing and when she came home on the Friday, um, she seemed a little bit agitated. We just assumed she had a bit of a fallout with a friend. We found out while she was away, um, mobile phones weren't working where they were, so he'd had a week with no contact, which I think, come the Friday when she came home, he was bombarding her. The absence of Danielle um, from East Tilbury due to the family holiday and the school trip was frustrating, Campbell. I think that their relationship was being called off by uh, Danielle, and he was frustrated. We know from witnesses that on the Sunday the 17th, the day before she went missing, she was having an argument with a man fitting Campbell's description outside a local shop on the East Tilbury estate. Campbell starts to realise there is a change in the relationship. She starts to distance herself, so he's losing the grip of power and control, and that's inciting fear. Campbell's entries into his Danielle's diary around this time certainly support this belief. The entries getting towards the time that she went missing uh, clearly indicated that she was very unhappy about this relationship and that she was trying to end it. And there were some significant entries about her being grumpy and, and not being responsive in the way that maybe you expected her to. The work on Campbell's computer was also complete. And his search history gave an insight into his frame of mind at the time. The weekend before Daniel went missing, he had looked at hundreds of images of young girls, scantily clad, some wearing schoolgirl outfits. And we were firmly of the belief that this was a, a motivator, a precursor uh, for what he intended to do on the Monday. Police want to find any trace of Danielle, including her school uniform and bag. This is an identical school uniform worn by Danielle the day she was last seen alive 17 weeks ago. And he'd looked at a picture of a young girl in school uniform, which was so similar to that of Danielle that initially Linda couldn't distinguish between the two of them. It wasn't a picture of Danielle, but it was ex ex exceptionally similar. On the Sunday, he deleted all of these images, but we were able to recover those from his computer. Firstly, we now know he's absolutely a child molester because he engages in that kind of contact and content. But secondly, what is it saying about his plans? She also used a mobile phone similar to this one. Cell site analysis had already been able to disprove Campbell's alibi on the morning of the 18th and the truth behind the two text messages sent to Campbell from Danielle's phone shortly after her disappearance. 
our expert was able to show that there had been a significant relationship between Stuart Campbell's mobile phone and Danielle's mobile phone during the hours after her disappearance. They were both in the same location and we were obviously fairly convinced that he had retained, for whatever reason, Danielle's phone, I think, to see what was going on and then latterly to try and convince people that Daniel was alive and well by sending texts to his phone purporting to be her. If this theory was true, then the two messages sent from Danielle's phone after she disappeared were not genuine. In order to prove this, the police brought in forensic linguistics expert, Professor Malcolm Coulthard. What I did first of all was to say what I need is examples of Stuart's texting so I can compare the two. I simply had examples of how she texted and I had one text that was recovered from Stuart's phone. So what were the kinds of patterns that she was using in the three days before she disappeared and see to what extent were the two messages in those same patterns. Could Malcolm find evidence within these two texts to prove that they'd been fabricated and that Stuart Campbell was in fact their author? The first text message that was sent from Danielle's phone to Stuart's phone read, Hiya Stu, what you up to? I'm in so much trouble at home at the moment. Everyone hates me, even you. What the hell have I done now? Why won't you just tell me? Text back, please. Love Dan. And the second one sent a day later. Hi Stu, thanks for being so nice. You are the best uncle ever. Tell mum I'm so sorry. Love your loads, Dan. It's hard to think back to almost 20 years ago, but texting was a very different activity. There were only eight keys that were used and so people made up their own abbreviations and so they would possibly identify a person by the kinds of ways that they abbreviated. And there were about five or six items which said that it was unlikely that Danielle had actually produced the messages. She would spell what? W-A-T. The one example that we had from Stuart was that he spelt it W-O-T, which was the way it sounds. And there were two examples in the first message of W-O-T like that. And interestingly, almost all of her messages ended TXTB. That was her favorite way for writing text back. The first message ends with a request, but it's written in the full form text. And then I think it says BCK, so it says text BCK, which never occurred in her messages. The police certainly felt that this evidence was strong and what I had to say strengthened it. 43-year-old Stuart Campbell is being held on suspicion of murder. Police have already extended the time he can be held for. Police were convinced they had enough evidence to charge Stuart Campbell with Danielle's abduction and murder. However, with the absence of a body, they knew it would be difficult to get the CPS to agree, especially when the publicity surrounding the case had thrown up potential sightings of Danielle. We went on to Crime Watch, which was by necessity because of the public demand. But what it led to was over 500 sightings of Danielle all over the country, and of course each one of those had to be investigated, negated, and, and potentially searched. You need to be able to say that you've actually gone, investigated, look, looked into it, and, uh, and, and it wasn't, wasn't her. We had to prove Daniel was dead, and that she hadn't just simply run away. Had she run away, which was the, 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 the defence had alluded to, would she have taken a change of clothing? Would she have taken a, a charger for her phone? Would she have taken money? The answer to all of that was no, she hadn't, but we had to prove that. So we put a very complete advice file into the Crown Prosecution Service on the 20th of October. 
Uh, and subsequent, at the end of that week, uh, the Crown Prosecution Service gave us the green light uh, to charge um, Stuart Campbell with the abduction and murder of, of Daniel. Stuart Campbell had now been charged with the abduction and murder of his 15-year-old niece, Danielle Jones. As he chose to plead not guilty, he faced a full trial at Chelmsford Crown Court. The trial began in October 2002. The trial was a very big issue. We had over 100 prosecution witnesses. Personally, I felt a tremendous uh, responsibility. Although there'd been hundreds of people involved in the case, I'd put the case papers in. We were desperate for that evidence to come out in the way that we knew it, it should be. I was the first one to give evidence and I was very anxious that where I would be standing, it would be very hard not to see him. And that I found quite harrowing. Um, the, whole, the whole court experience was not, not something I'd ever want to go through again. He used to write notes back and forth to his um, solicitor and I found that very frustrating. He, so he almost had a little bit of control over what was going on by giving notes and, and having his own paperwork. The defence case lasted two days uh, and I think they had one witness. Um, and although we were feeling that Campbell would give evidence, he never did give evidence. He was not brave enough to take the stand. Why? Because you've got to lie out and stand, lie through your teeth. So, easier not to take the stand. Amongst those who did give evidence for the prosecution was forensic linguistics expert, Professor Malcolm Coulthard. Forensic linguistics is a unique area of expertise because it's the only area in which the expert is not the only expert. Because everyone who speaks English is an expert on English. The jury had the text messages in front of them. So what I have to do is to draw their attention to particular features and then they have their own expertise and they can evaluate the evidence that I'm giving them. And that often turns out to be a very powerful kind of evidence because the jury then has its own firm opinion. It was pretty damning evidence, to be honest. But to the surprise of police, a brand new piece of prosecution evidence also came out during the trial. Inside the, uh, the bag that was found in the loft, which contained all the other paraphernalia, there was a lip gloss. but we didn't actually understand the significance of that lip gloss until during the trial, uh, when a friend of Danielle's um, stated that they had been shopping before she went missing, when they had bought um, similar lip glosses. She'd come home from her field trip on the Friday. On the Saturday, she'd gone to a local shopping centre with a friend. We'd managed to do some really good work around that and tied down through the batch code that the, the lip gloss found had actually come from a store in Lakeside around about that time. We know that obviously the week before Daniel went uh, went missing, she'd been on uh, on a school trip, and Stuart Campbell had definitely not seen her. So the only way that Stuart Campbell could have that in his possession uh, was if he'd abducted and been with Daniel on the 18th of June. And Linda has a theory about what happened that day. On the Monday, I think. She obviously realised he was on the estate. Then it added up that Mitchell had seen her turn the opposite way. We assume at the time he was waiting at the end of the road. She saw him and turned around to avoid him. We were able to plot on a map the significant interventions of Stuart Campbell between her home address and that school bus. And of course, we know that she never made the school bus. Where we think she was actually put into the van is literally around the corner to our house. I think in my heart, I think she was ready to blow the whistle. 
And I think he knew that. He had to silence her. And the only way of silencing her was permanent. We, we're never going to know this, but that's what I, I feel. The prosecution case was compelling, and after a 10-week trial, it took the jury 11 hours to come back with a guilty verdict. He just flopped down in the chair. He just literally sat down, almost in disbelief that, that he could possibly be found guilty. Yeah, he was given a life sentence uh, with a minimum uh, term to serve of 20 years, um, which I think we felt at the time was appropriate. We all hoped then that having been found guilty, that he would eventually give up the location of where Daniel's body was and we were able to return Daniel to Tony and Linda. Early on, um, I did write to him in prison um, and say uh, words to the effect of, for someone you were supposed to have loved so much, why can you not tell us where she is? Do you not think she deserves to have a proper burial? Absolutely no response at all. Absolutely no Never to tell us where she is, I think, is his, his final control. And I don't think he'll ever give that up. The police have done everything they could to try and find Danielle. They've still not given up. There was well over a thousand searches that took place over probably about an 18 month period from the time that Daniel went missing up to and including the time of the trial. Daniel remains a, a missing person and the, the case never really fu fully closes. There's always someone that will sort of assess and, and take action where it's actually required. Daniel's body may have been buried here. It could be that other items linking to a disappearance and murder are also concealed here two years ago now, um, further evidence was given to the police about a location of some garages which were very close to his home. It became apparent that someone had seen a blue van at the time. There was a, a particular garage that had a patch of flooring that the concrete didn't match the rest of the flooring. So they decided that they would um, excavate the ground. I can remember going to the garages and staring at this area on the ground that was perfectly body sized. And I think I thought this is going to be it. It needs to be slow, it needs to be methodical and painstaking because ultimately when we leave, I need to be able to speak to Daniel's family and categorically confirm to them whether or not Daniel's body has been buried here or not. Unfortunately, it turned out that there was nothing there. So we, we do have to go through these things periodically, but we'll continue to go through it as long as we have to, if the end result is, is Daniel. But perhaps the best hope is Helen's law. Under brand new government legislation, Campbell could be refused parole unless he reveals the whereabouts of Daniel's body. It's so important this law goes through because it's not just us. There are more cases than you would like to think there are where there are no bodies. And it's the most important thing to us now to have her home. To give her the dignity that she deserves, the dignity of being buried, the dignity of her brother saying goodbye to her. Just a lovely young innocent girl that was taken too early. In May 2019, the government agreed to review legislation in relation to murderers who fail to disclose the location of their victims. They've acknowledged that this should be taken into consideration when an individual withholding information is being considered for parole. With Stuart Campbell eligible to apply for parole in 2022, it's hoped that these changes could finally mean some limited comfort for Danielle's family and others.